the, the media has been having a collective meltdown about what Elon is doing for the last month. Mm -hmm. uh, first, they accused him of being a Thanos type supervillain for snapping 50% of the employees out of existence. <laughs> then they said that he was starving the employees by charging for lunch. Uh, and then most recently, they said the company was going to uh, have an imminent collapse. Why? Because Elon offered the employees a generous voluntary severance package if they didn't want to return to the office and work hard. And it's now two weeks later and the site is still running just fine. There's been no collapse. And yet all these media personality and uh, you know, these uh, pundits were tearfully saying their goodbyes on Twitter as if the site was going to you know, implode a, a couple of weeks ago. So you have to understand that he is being attacked in this ridiculous way. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. My guest today is David Sachs. David is an entrepreneur, tech investor, film producer, and the co-host of the All In podcast, which I highly recommend. He's general partner at Kraft Ventures, a venture capital firm he co-founded. He was the founding COO of PayPal, which makes him a part of the so-called PayPal Mafia, which includes folks like Elon Musk and Peter Thiel. He was an angel investor in Facebook, Uber, SpaceX, Airbnb, and many other successful companies. And he produced the film, Thank You for Smoking, which was nominated for several Golden Globes. David and I talk about his background as an entrepreneur and investor. We discuss his critique of what he calls the expert class as well as the professional class. We talk about the problems with elite colleges and universities. We discuss the attributes that made the PayPal mafia so successful. We talk about Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter and his controversial leadership style. And finally, we talk about our mutual hobby, chess. So without further ado, David Sachs. So I'm a big fan of the All In podcast. Uh, me and my girlfriend both are actually. And so that's the, the, the majority of where I've encountered you and your views are on that podcast, which I really recommend to fans of this podcast. I think you'll, uh, they'll enjoy that one. Um, so I guess before I get into all the various topics of mutual interest that we have, I want to know just a little bit about your bio did you always want to be an entrepreneur and tech investor or, or was that a goal that you ha had as a teen and young adult or did you kind of stumble into it? Uh, probably both. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I, I was sort of entrepreneurial. I sold candy and Pepsis at soccer games and things like that. And, uh, you know, the, the classic lemonade stand. But I didn't know how to get into entrepreneurship. I graduated Stanford in 1994. This was the year before um, the internet really took off in a commercial way. And it wasn't clear how you got on an entrepreneurial track. And, um, and so I ended up going to law school like most people of that era who didn't quite know what to do. And then eventually I got a phone call in 1999 from my uh, friend from college, Peter Thiel, who was starting a company and that company ended up becoming PayPal and he recruited me into it. And that's how I kind of got into the whole tech thing. So you were a member of the so-called PayPal Mafia, which included people like Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, Reid Hoffman, and a surprisingly high number of other extremely successful CEOs of major tech companies. Um, so I'm curious, in your view, why has the Pay PayPal Mafia gone on to be so successful? Like, what Was it that you were just a highly talented, self-selected group of people from the beginning? Or was there some lesson learned from the PayPal experience that, that spawned all of these other successful companies? I think it was both those things. I think it was the people. I think it was the lessons learned. I think it was also the timing. So on the people, the thing to understand there is that the PayPal crew was primarily recruited through friendship networks. So Peter recruited his friends who he had gone to college with at Stanford. Um, those people then recruited their friends. Max Levchin, who went to U of I, recruited his engineering friends from college. And, and, and a big part of the reason why is no one wanted to, to work for this company. You know, we were a bunch of total unknowns in their 20s. Um, I don't even think Peter was 30 yet. And uh, doing a startup in the late 90s was still considered to be an incredibly risky thing to do. So um, Peter was unable to really recruit anybody uh, except for his friends. And um, and so that's how the initial team 
got recruited, we didn't use headhunters and recruiters and so forth. As a result of that, the um, the personality types were um, they they were sort of cut from the same cloth. There were these very entrepreneurial types, and so when PayPal was ultimately acquired by eBay. And then eBay kind of was very corporatist in their culture, and they kind of drove out all these entrepreneurial types. They went on to create uh, more companies. Um, they were kind of wired to do that. The, um, the timing of it was such that PayPal was, uh, it IPO'd and then was acquired by eBay in 2002. It was, really, it was the first successful IPO, tech IPO after the dot-com crash. And so the timing was that everybody else had kind of given up on Silicon Valley. Um, the joke back in the early 2000s was that B2B meant back to banking and B2C meant back to consulting. Um, you know, everyone had kind of packed up and, and gone home. And at that very moment, <clears throat> you had this exodus of talent from, from PayPal who wanted to create more companies that had a good experience. They, um, you know, they weren't disillusioned the way that so many people were after the dot-com crash. And then the final piece of it is they had the playbooks. They had the lessons that had worked so well at PayPal specifically in being able to hack distribution, you know, creating viral products. And those playbooks would go on to be used by the PayPal mafia companies in the following years. So you had this confluence of very entrepreneurial people having been a successful experience, knowing the playbooks <clears throat> and having the field basically to themselves as a result of the dot-com crash. And that enabled us to have an outsized impact on the next, call it 20 years of Silicon Valley. So is it true that you only invest in software companies? Uh, and if so, you know, why not branch out into retail with, with a mind like yours? Do you think you're leaving money on the table or is there a philosophy behind that? I, I've generally learned that um, it's very hard to make non-software businesses work mm -hmm. on a risk return base. They're just so much harder, actually. Um, mm -hmm. the, the problem is, as soon as you're dealing with the physical world, you're dealing with cogs, you know, like the physical components of products, um, they're actually much tougher businesses to make work, um, and also the the um, the upside isn't as great. So operationally, they're more more complicated. It takes it takes actually a really good operator to make a uh, a physical world business like a low margin business work. Whereas with software, it's a pure mar you know it's a it's a high gross margin business. It's um, if you the the thing that Bill Gates figured out about software that made him the richest man in the world is that all the cost uh, consists of creating the first version, the first instance of the product. Every subsequent co copy of the product is free. Mm -hmm. And so if you can actually create mass market software, you know, it's, um, it's, pure, uh, it's a pure you know, intellectual property business. It becomes extremely profitable um, at, um, you know, at, in, at high numbers of, of customers. So you, you start with something that... Um, you know, is very high margin. Uh, and at the same time, the wind is at your back. There is a huge demand for more and more software. Business is always changing. And so there's always more needs for software. And it, you know, as a founder, you really only have to be good at, at two things. You have to be able to create a product that people want, and then you have to be able to distribute it or sell it and, um, or at least recruit a partner who's good at sales. I find that's like a much easier playbook for, um, founders to implement than, again, running an operationally complicated business. And when I've branched out and invested in some of those more operationally complicated businesses, it hasn't worked as well as when I've invested in either the pure software or uh, sort of pure marketplace business. So the point you make about the, the first copy costing money and every subsequent copy being free, that's a point that has been made about the music industry and the the move with which I'm old enough just barely to remember a world with CDs and the move to MP3s and the frenzy about, you know, LimeWire and, and FrostWire and pirating around, say, 2006, giving way to the Spotify and Apple Music era, where it seems like major artists, you know, they can post their, uh, they can post their dividends from thousands and thousands of plays on Spotify. And it seems pretty meager relative to an earlier era, uh, precisely because it costs nothing to simply, ha you know, to stream basically an, an, an MP3. So, and, and I suppose I haven't paid attention in the past couple months, but I know earlier this year, 
uh, Spotify, Spotify stock was going down in value. Uh, and there was a sense that maybe people had overestimated the, the soundness of the streaming model. Uh, do you have a take on that, uh, on Spotify in particular and on the soundness of streaming in general? I don't have a specific take on streaming businesses. I think you make an interesting point that um, that music and Hollywood in general, the media business, does they are intellectual property businesses as well, and so they have a similar dynamic where all of the expenses in the first copy, incremental copies, are free, and so therefore the more customers that you can sign up, the more profitable they become, and this is why. you know, both Hollywood and the tech industry have benefited tremendously from globalization. You just want the markets to be as big as possible, and it just makes the winners as big as possible. The same thing has happened in sports, right? Uh, this all tended to happen, I think it started in the 1990s, where, uh, you know, Michael Jordan uh, became not just, you know, a famous American athlete, but a global, you know, global athlete. Um, same thing with Tiger Woods in golf. Um, you had, or, you know, J.K. Rowling in um in books, you know, and you could go on is that you started seeing the creation of these billion dollar type winners because the markets just got so big, they became totally global. The The difference between tech and I think entertainment is that historically tech um, has been a more open ecosystem. There have been ways of getting distribution that don't rely on going through gatekeepers. And I think the big problem in entertainment, whether it's music or movies or any of these types of content businesses, is that um, Hollywood has kind of an, um, a cartel of a small number of studios or you know big media companies, and they tend to own distribution. And so most of the profits in that business tend to accrue to these like gatekeeper type companies. The very, very best creators are able to Uh, demand a deal that sees them rewarded, but the long tail of creators just don't do very well. In technology, it's been the case that, uh, that again, there are ways of getting distribution that do not rely on going through gatekeepers. So in the case of PayPal, we figured out that we should make the product viral. In other words, that users would recruit each other. The distribution was person to person or P to P. Uh, Facebook used similar tactics where they would basically slurp in your address book and invite your friends who weren't on the product yet. First, it would look to see who was on there and it would make it very easy for you to friend them. Uh, and, and, you know, other social networks did something similar. There's a whole bunch of these tactics, these these viral tactics that have been turned into playbooks or, or called growth hacking. And so it's possible for that new startup to get very big without um, having to pay an exorbitant tax to uh, to Apple or Google. I mean, to be sure, there are gatekeepers now in the mobile world, and we're seeing this play out right now in this um, in this uh, feud that <laughs> that Twitter and um, and Apple are having because it mm-hmm. seems like Apple is now threatening to kick Twitter out of its App Store. That was the latest news. Uh, so there are absolutely these gatekeeper companies that have now emerged in in mobile, and there are reasons to to fear that the mobile ecosystem is much much less open than the web was, but. Mm. Certainly in the heyday of the World Wide Web, um, it was completely wide open and um, it made it possible for founders to capture the fruits of their labor, the benefits of what they had created without having those innovations effectively be owned by the, um, by the gatekeeper companies. And it, it, a similar breakout has not been possible in the entertainment business. What are your favorite holiday meals, activities, and traditions? Whether it's Thanksgiving or Christmas, cooking probably comes to mind. And for many families, that means cooking meat and seafood. This holiday season, I highly recommend using ButcherBox. ButcherBox takes the guesswork out of finding high-quality meat and seafood that you can trust. They send you 100% grass-fed beef, free-range organic chicken, pork raised crate-free, and wild-caught seafood. Everything is humanely raised with no antibiotics or added hormones. You can get whatever you want and only what you want delivered right to your doorstep. Plus, shipping is free for the continental U.S. and there are no surprise fees. Choose from a variety of box plan options, from curated to customized, and change your plan whenever you want. Enjoy a range of high-quality cuts that are hard to come by at the grocery store at an amazing price. You can also get inspiration tips and hacks for awesome recipes to cook for yourself. 
The holiday season is made better and tastier by ButcherBox. For a limited time, they're offering our listeners ground beef for the life of your membership and 10% off your first order. So sign up today at butcherbox.com slash Coleman and use the code Coleman to get 10% off your first box and ground beef for the life of your membership. That's butcherbox.com slash Coleman and use code Coleman to claim this deal. I just want to know we're talking on November 30th and the news is moving so fast on Twitter and Apple and other topics we're going to touch that uh, by the time someone listens to this, it, things may have changed slightly. But um, so I want to go back before we get into Twitter and Hollywood and some other things I want to discuss. I want to talk about college because I've heard you on the All In podcast have a critique of of colleges that I think is uh, in line with, with with things I've talked about on this podcast. I remember being a sophomore in college and reading the the economist Brian Kaplan's book, The Case Against The Case Against Education, which argued that almost all of the income boost that you get from having a college degree comes via the signaling value of having completed the degree rather than from any new skills that you acquired by actually attending classes. And uh, like like most great arguments, it the second I heard it, it seemed sort of obviously true in retrospect but was, I guess, counterintuitive um, at the time. You know, the notion that college is effectively a four-year IQ and work ethic test rather than an experience that actually makes you a smarter and more valuable worker uh, just made sense of a lot of the strange dynamics and busy work and, um, you know, everything else that I experienced at, at Columbia. I'm curious... It, uh, what what is your general critique of college and the values that they uh, the value that they do or don't transmit to students? Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. I I think I had a similar experience uh, as you did. Was it like almost thirty years ago now? Um, th- my way into this actually is to look at um, polling data. If you look at the um, political scientist uh, Roy Teixeira, he's written a lot about this. That the biggest divide in the electorate is um, is over whether somebody has a college degree or not. Um, this single variable accounts for something like a thirty point gap in uh, voting preference as between Repo- Republicans and Democrats, and uh, it's it's quite stunning. I think this is probably the biggest gap in the electorate. It transcends other types of divisions, and. Um, you know, Tushera writes a lot about this. He calls the the folks with college degrees, it's the professional class, and those without college degrees are the working class. America is a, a predominantly working ca- class country. It's about two thirds working class, about one third professional class. But the um, it's all the uh, college graduates who control the institutions because you do need these credentials and degrees. And, um, and and I think this is fundamentally what is creating all of the sense of stress and fracture in our society is that the um, is that the professional class runs all the institutions, including the colleges, uh, for their benefit and in accordance with their ideology. And it is not the same ideology as the majority of the country, and that sets up in a democracy that is unsustainable somehow. And it sets up this, um, the, I think this fundamentally is the battle line of what's going on in our society. And just to be clear, Tushera is a, a Democrat. You know, back in the early 2000s, he wrote a book called, I think it's called The Emerging Democratic Majority, mm. in which he predicted a, uh, a coalition uh, that would create Democratic presidents as far as the eye can see. It was a coalition of um, uh, women, minorities, young people, and, and working class and they would come together, and, and Tushira saw this as a very sustainable majority. Um, and he was hailed as a prophet within the Democratic Party when Obama uh, seemed to create that very coalition uh, to become a two-term president. But lately, over the last few years, he's been warning that the Democratic Party has abandoned its uh, working-class roots and has become a professional-class party. And he thinks that it's moved far to left on socio-cultural issues, that basically it's developed this kind of elite and a feat professional class sensibility. And um, he's been kind of warning them to, to course correct around that. In any event, this is sort of like what's happening politically. I think that all of this is ultimately downstream of the universities. I mean, the universities were 
I guess the question you have to ask is why does a college degree create this 30 point gap in voting preference? And in, you know, it's not just uh, political party affiliation. It's also like on every hot button social issue you could pull on, uh, it creates these large divides. And, um, and I think the simple answer is that, um, is that the colleges and the education, the elite education system in general were captured by the far left a long time ago, and they've kind of turned them into indoctrination centers and uh, re-education camps. And so the fundamental quid pro quo of our civilization is if that if you want the economic and social advancement that a college degree brings you, you have to submit to voluntary re-education for four years, maybe longer. And I, I tend to think that you know, so many of our political divides are essentially downstream of this, this, this problem. Um, now I, I do think that there are different reactions that people have to this phenomenon. I, I tend to think there's three types of students or student reactions to this. So I tend to think that the first is that you can rebel against it. Um, I tend to think that maybe 1% of the students do this and then, and those, those people tend to become either founders, uh, which is why I can stay in business having the views I have, um, or they tend to become kind of more um, conservative or independent per- media personalities. I think the, the vast majority are kind of go along to get along. They let this ideology wash mm-hmm. over them. They're more interested in professional advancement. And so they're not super ideological, but they're kind of um, predisposed to um, accepting the, the sort of the, the dominant ideology of the of the this professional class. Mm-hmm. I'd say that's probably about eighty uh, percent of the students, and then I think the other nineteen percent become are true believers, and then they go on and staff. Uh, they, they they tend to do the professional class jobs that don't pay very well. Uh, so I think the the sort of go along to get along types go work at McKinsey and Goldman Sachs, mm-hmm. and the true believers go staff the um, the nonprofits and the activist groups and the Democratic Party and the foundations and, um, and, and the media, you know, they go on to, to media, uh, sort of mainstream media jobs. And, um, I, I tend to think this explains a lot of the, um, the division in our, in our society right now. Yeah. So I Sorry, was, that def- was a long, that was no, a long no. dissertation. <laughs> uh, well, you have a lot to say about it. And, I, uh, so I was definitely in that 1% that rebelled when I was at Columbia I tried writing for the student newspaper, but it was so absolutely captured by, uh, by students with, with far left ideology that, you know, I could hardly write a sentence without them trying to fact check me on a book they'd never read. And so I, you know, at some point gave up and just started, I had, I had a hunger to not just say things I was supposed to say, uh, to get along. And I, I also had, I think what, what my friend Camille Foster calls the melon in force field, which is, you know, the, the fact, the, the fact of the matter is as a, as a black person, a lot of the people critiquing me on campus were white. And in their mind that gave them less, uh, less standing to critique me if, if I did have contrarian views and, and in some way made it easier for me socially to actually be honest about what I thought, I think re- relative, cause I couldn't really be called a racist, which was, um, which was just a ubiquitous a slur hur- hurled at people. Um, and I, I remember thinking at the time when I was finally able to find people on campus to sort of openly talk about the, the, the insane capture with, and, and I guess I should just provide context. Like, I, you know, I grew up in a very blue town. I think I knew one Republican in my town growing up. It was just, you know, Obama signs as far as the eye could see. And that was my context. And I was, you know, a, de- a default Democrat and, you know, in, in my self-concept, quite progressive. And then I got to Columbia and I felt like I was dropped into a simulation where, you know, the concern about racism was cranked to 10 where, and the actual racism was cranked to zero. It was like the most progressive, least racist place, most privileged place I had ever been in. And yet everyone was hyperventilating saying, you know, we are experiencing racism every day on campus. And I knew that to be untrue from my lived experience to use a a phrase that is kind of in vogue at that time. Um, But, you know, I, I think when I was there, I would talk to some friends and I estimated that 
like you, maybe 1% of students spoke out against the orthodoxy. My estimation was like 85 or 90% of students are kind of the the herd, if you will. Like they, many of them will privately critique the excesses of it, but will never publicly do so. And in my estimation, the true believers were no more than maybe five to 10% of the student population. And it, it was, I don't know if there's a name for this dynamic, but I, I know others have pointed it out that you don't need, you don't need 30, 40% of the population to believe something in order for a whole subculture or a whole society to, you know, sort of pay lip service to those views. So that's, that was my experience there. Yeah, that's how, I mean, that sounds, um, you know, very similar to the dynamics on campus, uh, when I was a student, um, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I, I think you were brave to rebel, even though you couldn't be called a racist. Um, you know, there are other horrible names they can yeah. throw at you. Oh, certainly. And yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I think um, I think I think it's exactly right. I mean, I think your percentages are probably you know at the end of the day more more accurate. Um, the, the true believers have an influence that goes well beyond their their numbers, and a lot of it has to do with the cancellation tactics that they're willing to use, the way that they will smear anybody who disagrees with their agenda. If you're, you know, if you're part of that, again, that what 80, 90% of the herd, you just don't want to stick your neck out and there's just no upside for you in, um, in challenging, uh, the, the untruths and being called, you know, being accused of something. So, um, this is a huge part of the dynamic and we see it now, um, you know, in the media and, and the tactics that, that they use, it's, um, you know, it's a nonstop, um, you know, smear machine and, and sort of narrative generation machine. And as soon as one narrative has been disproven, they're onto the next one and they completely memory hold the fact that they were just spouting something completely untrue. Um, what's, you know, it's, it's like Andrew Sullivan says, we all live on campus now. I mean, that same sort of fevered, dynamic in which we're constantly being told something untrue that we're living in, you know, the simulation, um, is it's, it feels like it's being pushed on us by the mainstream media every day. Hmm. Um, it, it feels, incre- you know, the, the world today feels more like, um, Stanford when I was a student there as, um, as it ever has. Hmm. And I, and I think, you know, a lot of people back when Peter and I were rebelling against it in the early nineties, um, and, you know, we, we, we wrote, you know, we, we wrote a bunch of stuff about it. I think people were kind of like, ah, this is, you know, campus hijinks. It doesn't really matter. Um, well, it ended up mattering a lot because all of those graduates from elite schools went on to go staff all the institutions, you know, from the New York times to the school boards to, um, you know, the foundations and so on. And, um, and you've seen this very far leftward shift uh, you know, again, in all of our professional institutions, they've all kind of gone woke at the same time. Uh, and I think, and including the fortune 500, you know, um, you sort of this dynamic of woke capitalism. And, you know, again, the question is why, how is it that the fortune 500 and the New York times and the nonprofit world all went woke at the same time? Well, it's a class dynamic. I mean, that doesn't happen. Um, you know, that, that can only happen when the attitudes of an entire class of people shift. And, that class is a professional class. And again, I think it's all downstream of what happened at the Academy uh, decades ago. So I think, I mean, I, in the past, I, I've said you could view this whole phenomenon just through the word Latinx, which, you know, so I'm half Puerto Rican and the, the Puerto Rican half of my family um, came here in the late fifties and settled in the South Bronx and were very poor. Uh, and, and so. I grew up often visiting my my grandmother who lived in the South Bronx and my Spanish speaking family and, you know, never once heard that term. And then I got to Colombia and I had, you know, people who, who didn't even speak Spanish telling me that Latinx was the polite way to refer to Hispanic people. And I just picture how much my family from the South Bronx would laugh at that absurd bastardization of a term, which doesn't even fit the the physics of Spanish. Um, right. And 
and I, you know, I, I thought that was, a, and then, and then years later, I was, I was pleased to see that something like 95 or 96 percent of of Hispanics in America don't identify or prefer that term. Yet it is, you know, it is used now from leaders in the Democratic Party as if it's what the Hispanic community is demanding, when really it's what the, you know, Elizabeth Warren staffers are demanding because they all went to the colleges where that's used. And, and of course, there's nothing inherently wrong with there being a bubble, right? Like a, a, we all live in bubbles kind of by definition, but as a politician, I think you have to be aware that you are living in a bubble. You have to make an effort to correct for your bubble. And I see very, you know, anyone who, who points this out, someone like Matthew Iglesias, who I think was, you know, formerly and probably still quite respected as a sort of democratic strategist or, or a sort of thinker in the Democratic Party, or someone like David Shore, anyone who points this out is, is demonized uh, and in Shore's case, hounded out of, hounded out of the, the, the company he was at. And so, um, you know, it's a, it's a dangerous uh, dynamic for the, the left wing of the Democratic Party to refuse to see outside a, a sort of elite kind of upper class bubble of its own creation. Right. Right. It's the sort of, it's the prevailing attitudes of this, um, I guess you call it the coastal elite, but it's basically the, this white progressive, uh, woke professional class. And the message is, I think it's alienate. You see this reflected in the, in the polling numbers that Hispanics are moving to the Republican party in big numbers. And I think there's two reasons for it. One is that the Republican party is sort of realigning as a working class party. And the other is that the, um, the, the attitudes and ways of communicating that the Democratic Party has, which again is is it's targeted at more of this um, this college educated kind of a feat woke progressive sensibility, it does that message does not resonate uh, with Hispanics. So I think we're seeing a big political realignment, and um, not just Hispanics, but um, lots of other minority groups are increasingly moving to the Republican Party. There's clearly a big shift or realignment underway. And I think it, again, it has a lot to do with the Democratic Party abandoning its roots as a working class party and kind of, you know, going uh, all in on, um, on, on, the, on, the, on what Tushar calls professional class hegemony. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, the, 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 um, I, again, I would come back to, I think the biggest problem is just that the media is completely dominated. I'm talking about the mainstream media is by, um, by this sort of woke professional class sensibility. And um, the media is the prism through which reality is refracted. I mean, the media creates the simulation. And um, when they're describing things in a way that's simply not true, it, um, and, and there's no feedback mechanism for really changing that. I mean, I guess people just opt out and then they start getting more and more of their news information from alternative sources. I guess that's mm-hmm. the reaction. But, um, but I think that I think more and more people are realizing that the media is just hopelessly biased, is hopelessly bought in to this ideology. And, um, and I, I think it really does account for, again, a lot of the division we see in our society today. I just read a CNN article, I think two days ago, about how daylight savings time has a disproportionate impact on black people and therefore is structurally racist. Um, right. I mean, I think that says it all. Right. There's just this total preoccupation and obsession with, um, with, you know, racial differences and, um, it, they're imagined when they don't occur, um, stories that, uh, that don't need to be about race or somehow made about race. Um, it is it is this um, all-consuming preoccupation of the sort of woke progressive left, and um, it's counterproductive. It's untrue and it's counterproductive. I don't see how it's helping anything. So uh, on the All In podcast, uh, which again I really recommend to people, you often have a critique of I think I think you've used the term expert class. Uh, and your your critique of experts 
in the past three to six months has often centered around COVID policy and, and more recently around foreign policy and Ukraine in particular. So what is it that irks you about the experts in general and, and on those two topics? I'd say the lack of accountability is probably the number one thing. Um, we have this, this class, and this is very much tied in with the, this professional class of Gemini. We have this class of, of experts, and they're anointed by the media. And they are always wanting to tell us that we can't have an opinion on something like COVID because we're not experts. And yet, when the time comes to hold them accountable for their views, which turn out to be so wrong, they want some sort of amnesty. This was actually an article in The Atlantic recently about how um, we need a COVID amnesty program um, for all the the bogus predictions that were made uh, by the experts. And um, this, I think this is really offensive. I mean, first of all, no one's talking about prosecuting experts who are wrong, I don't think. So what we're talking about for amnesty is to not remind people of all the predictions that they made, of all the policies that they recommended that were so unbelievably destructive. I mean, the lockdowns, the impact on small businesses, the learning loss that's going to hurt kids for an entire generation. We're just now supposed to forget all of that. We're just supposed to give them sort of carte blanche amnesty. Well, it seems to me that if you want to hold yourself up as an expert, and say that only experts should decide, you also have to be accountable for your track record. And um, and again, they they, they want immunity from that. And and there's a very similar dynamic with the foreign policy establishment. The same people who got us into all of these failed wars in the Middle East, the Iraq war, which we were lied into, uh, the 20-year occupation of Afghanistan, which is a total failure, uh, our failed interventions in Libya and Syria, and on and on. I mean, there's just no accountability for the people who made those decisions. And in fact, many of them are back and they're now conducting our Ukraine policy. So it seems like we have this um, professional class that, again, purports to be an expert class. It believes that only it should make all of the decisions and that it shouldn't be accountable when it, everything goes so horribly awry. If you've been watching my videos for a long time, you may or may not have noticed this, but I certainly have. My hairline is slowly receding, and I don't like it. I am one of the almost 42% of men who experience hair loss in their lifetime. The good news is that there are options available to help stop balding in its tracks. The sooner you start treatment for hair loss, the easier it is to keep the hair you do have. Roman offers clinically proven medication to help treat hair loss, all from the comfort and privacy of your home. Roman offers both prescription medication and over-the-counter treatments. Roman also offers specially formulated shampoos and conditioners with ingredients that fortify and moisturize hair to look fuller. Research shows that about 80% of men who use prescription hair loss treatment had no further hair loss after two years. Research has also shown that men who use hair loss treatments feel better about their overall appearance. Getting started is simple. Complete a free online visit. Then a U.S. licensed healthcare professional will work with you to find the best treatment plan. If medication is appropriate, Roman ships it directly to you in discreet packaging with free two-day shipping. The whole process is straightforward and discreet. Treatments start at $20 per month on a quarterly plan. Go to ro.co slash Coleman. That's ro.co slash Coleman. Right now, Roman has a special offer for our listeners. Use the link and get 20% off your first order. Just go to ro.co slash Coleman today. Once again, that's ro.co slash Coleman for 20% off. Hmm. Yeah, so the way I've thought about this is, you know, we know how, how deep partisan bias shapes most people's opinions. There's, you know, countless Kahneman and Tversky studies. Like if you ask a group of Democrats what they think about Trump's latest policy, they will give you reasons why they think it's bad that don't have to do with Trump or partisanship. But if you ask, you know, the same group of Democrats or a similar group of Democrats, what they think of that same policy, but instead you tell them Obama actually implemented it, they will come up with all these reasons why it's actually a good policy. Most people are are like this. And you would think that very intelligent people, you know, high IQ people are less vulnerable to this kind of bias. But I think it was Kahneman and Tversky studies or some similar researchers, which really found that they're not. And in, in fact, 
very intelligent people are just better and more clever at working backwards from the partisan conclusion that they've already come to and coming up with, with a post hoc rationale. And, and, you know, what are experts, but high IQ people that, that have studied a topic at the end of the day. So I've, I've seen that with the expert class on politicized topics. I want to emphasize that because on non-political topics, something like astronomy, for example, the experts are great. They really do know more than the rest of us. And we pretty much should shut up and listen uh, because astronomy is not politicized. But on any topic that becomes politicized, like a topic like race and racial inequality, which is my specialty, the experts are atrocious. And, and on, you know, on race specifically, the experts skew heavily left. So the mistakes they make are always in the same direction. Right. Yeah, it's, um, I think that there's a huge amount of uh, tribalism, obviously political tribalism. Um, I think there's a huge amount of starting from the political result you want and then reverse engineering to uh, the position you're supposed to have on any given issue, which produces a ton of unprincipled, you know, inconsistency. So I remember like during the pandemic, like one small example of this was the way the media just wouldn't cover any of the alternative therapies for COVID that were being developed. And the reason was they wanted everyone to get vaccinated. That was sort of the end result that they wanted to get to. And so therefore, you know, anything that was presented as an alternative, this is the monoclonal antibodies, for example, they just wouldn't cover. They wouldn't treat it as something that needed to happen. That's just like one very, very small example. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's very much reasoning back from the political result you want to achieve. Um, I think that's a huge part of what's going on. You know, I think there's also just a, uh, a class bias to the, to the whole thing, to this idea of, of, um, of experts who need to be empowered and should be the sole deciders of things. Um, I've, you know, there's, uh, I've recently kind of, uh, been looking at the work of, uh, James Burnham, uh, you know, who wrote the managerial revolution. Are you, are you familiar with his stuff or no, I'm not. It's, 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 um, it's enjoying a little bit of a resurgence because he talks about, the um, the biases of the uh, sort of the professional managerial class, and he was writing in you know back in the mid twentieth century, like you know nineteen forties, nineteen fifties. And let me just read you a little passage. Mm. Um, this is actually so George Orwell wrote the introduction mm. to Burnham's book on um, the managerial revolution, and um, I think Orwell does mm. a nice job. Um, summarizing Burnham's thesis. I'll just, let me just read you this one paragraph and you tell mm-hmm. me if it sounds like where we are today. Mm-hmm. So Orwell's description is of Burnham's thesis is capitalism is disappearing, but socialism is not replacing it. What is now arising is a new kind of planned centralized society, which will be neither capitalist nor in any accepted sense of the word democratic. The rulers of this new society will be the people who effectively control the means of production. That is, Business executives, technicians, bureaucrats, and soldiers lumped together by Burnham under the name of managers. So basically, the sort of mid-level managers, experts, technocrats. These people will eliminate the old capitalist class, crush the working class, and so organize society that all power and economic privilege remain in their own hands. <laughs> so that's this is, uh, I think that's Orwell writing in 1940 um, about Burnham's thesis. Um, it's it's quite remarkable. I think what Burnham is suggesting is that in an advanced capitalist society, what happens is you have a need for mid level managers, and um, and so you start with the kind of the the heroic figure of the original bourgeois capitalism, or I just call it entrepreneurial capitalism, the kind of the original. Um, entrepreneurial capitalism that America was sort of built on. You had this figure of the captain of industry, the great entrepreneur. You could deride them as the robber baron. In any event, they create these great industries, these great businesses, but eventually they die or retire, and you need to hire professional managers to run these companies. And um, the professional managers are cut from a very different cloth as the, um, the entrepreneurial figure. And we even see this today. Uh, they go to the right schools, they get, you know, Harvard MBAs. Um, they are preoccupied with 
a resume and their credentials because the captain of industry creates, whereas the manager is hired. And that just creates hugely different incentives to hmm. some degree the, the the manager is always going to be a, a yes man because again they have to put themselves in a position to get hired what ultimately happens is that the loop gets closed once managers hire other managers we're now at a state of, of capitalism where most companies are controlled by boards of directors those boards of directors are not um, the, the founders may not even be on those boards anymore they retired a long time ago. And so, and in fact, those, um, those board members don't even necessarily own a lot of the company. So they are just professional managers hiring other professional managers. And so we've entered a closed loop where um, the society is not controlled by the original entrepreneurial capitalism. It's, it's uh, being controlled by uh, these agents. And I think that, uh, and there's a principal agent problem. Basically the, the agents are a class of people who uh, I'm referring to principals versus agents who are now pursuing their own interests and they seek to entrench their own power and prerogatives um, at the expense of the owners of, of, of capital. And, and I think there's something similar going on in our democracy. It, the, the, in, in politics, the, um, the, the analogous group to the owners of capital would be the people. I mean, they get to vote. And so they vote in a class of people, but though there can be a principal agent problem where those politicians ultimately represent their own interests. And I think this is even more true um, at the level of the, um, of, of the think tanks and the parties and the political establishment, which is even more insulated from the voters. And I think you certainly see this with the foreign policy establishment, that the foreign policy establishment chooses their own ranks, they police their own ranks. As a result, there's a tremendous amount of groupthink. Um, and they control the foreign policy of the United States, and they do so for their own benefit. Um, part, it can be economic benefit, like the sort of the, the military industrial complex, but it's mostly for their ideolo ideological benefit that they pursue. They pursue the policies that are interesting to them, that they're deeply invested in, that they're um, you know the ideology they believe in. It's basically they're on a on a crusade. Um, so I I tend to think that this is one of the huge dynamics happening in our society right now is that is that an advanced capitalist society needed to create middle managers from both a um in both in the economic sphere and in the political sphere but those middle level managers have now usurped the power that was really delegated to them uh i mean their power should only be a delegation from from the people who own the companies or from the voters and yet They've now found themselves in this position of being in control. And I think their goal now is to entrench themselves and perpetuate their privileges. And the way they do that is to make themselves immune from criticism and accountability. Hmm. And, um, and you see this with the, um, like we're talking about with the, the expert class saying they need to get amnesty. They can't be held accountable for any of their views. You see it with the rise of censorship, this professional class, and especially the media, which used to be the biggest advocates of free speech because their entire industry is based on the First Amendment, they now are fully bought into the idea of censorship. Why? Because it protects the professional class from criticism. They can basically censor their opponents. So it's, a, it's an interesting um, critique of what's happening in our society, this sort of, um, sort of Burnham idea. Obviously, he hasn't been around for like 50 years, something like that. But, um, but the, the, the people, there's, again, a resurgence of interest in his work because um, it just seems so relevant to what we're experiencing today. You know, it's, it feels like very deeply uh, cultural. It's, it's not just like one issue. And so it, it, it really feels like there's this deeper class divide in our society that's fueling a lot of things. So that segues into Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter because Elon obviously is famously an owner and founder and an incredibly successful one who is now managing a company that he did not found, but, um, but managing it with the mindset of a founder. And, and, yes. the, uh, no, and he, he, is the, he is the classic paradigmatic example of the um, of the hero 
of entrepreneurial capitalism, sort of the old bourgeois capitalism as opposed to the new managerial capitalism. Um, he, yes, he didn't found this particular company, but he is a founder. He is a captain of industry or you, you know, deride him as robber baron. That, that type of personality, it's that mm -hmm. larger than life, yeah. Ayn Randian type right. figure. And all the uh, forces arrayed against him are the forces of managerial capitalism. It's the media, it's the mid-level managers who are complaining. They don't want to have to be submit and be accountable to him, the owner. They want to control the policies, the trust and safety policies. They're the ones who think they're the experts. Um, and of course, it's their class allies in the media who every time Elon does something or become hysterical and predict the company's imminent collapse. Um, I think there's like a huge, again, sort of very deep class component to this. And, um, you know, Balaji, who's a, uh, Sir Vanassen, who's a friend of mine, a tech founder, had um, some tweets about this that I thought were just so spot on. Let me just read this to yeah. you. Um, he said, there's the individual dimension of capitalism, iconoclastic, heroic, entrepreneurial, risk tolerant. And then there's the bureaucratic dimension corporatist, conformist, HRified, risk averse. Mm -hmm. Woke capital is the latter. They don't like capitalism. They like the worst parts. Um, so then Balaji says, I might be obvious, but I have to put my finger on it. Why did these people who purported to hate capitalism become omnipresent at big companies? Mm. Partly hypocrisy, yes, but also these people wanted reward, not risk, power, not purpose, and a big company, not a small startup. All the parts the founder likes about capitalism, the creativity, the lack of structure, the adventure, and the motivation provided by the yawning chasm of failure below is what repels the conformist. They hate economic risk as viscerally as the founder loves it. Hmm. I think this is a great description of, again, the, the old entrepreneurial capitalism versus the new managerial capitalism. It's startups versus big companies. It's the contrarian versus the conformist. It's the risk and adventure seeker rather than that sort of risk averse mid-level manager. Um, it's the, it's the person who thinks they can uh, find a new need and a new opportunity, that entrepreneur who can spot something that's missed as opposed to the mid-level manager who simply wants to avoid risk, who thinks that all the answers are known. They don't really have to think about it very much. They can just conform to whatever the expert class says. Um, that just as a description feels very correct to me. And, um, and, you know, I see it like, cause I deal with the founders and we also deal with fortune 500 type execs. And I see that, you know, my old company PayPal has become one of those fortune 500 type companies run by those types of execs. And you really see the, the transformation. Um, I think one of the only reasons that I can, I can speak out in the way that we're talking now and have the views that I have is because Venture capital is the last redoubt of the old bourgeois capital capitalism model, the old mm -hmm. entrepreneurial capitalism model. It's the last place where that um, future captain of industry, the person who is nothing today and comes from nowhere, but one day hopes to be, rise to be that great person, lead that great adventure. Venture capitalism is the last redoubt of that old model. Um, I certainly could not, you know, state my views and be any kind of podcaster or media figure. If I was a fortune 500 executive, it just would absolutely not fly. Mm. And that is because the fortune 500 is completely in the grip of the managerial elite, just like the media is just like the universities are just like the democratic party is and, and so on down the line. So um, it, it, it seems to me, Elon is trying to do what you're saying is, is impossible, which is to be a CEO, the CEO of Twitter and also be able to have hot takes, which may be viewed as political, even if they're correct, post memes, um, you know, and just have this really casual relationship with communication and, and so forth. Um, and, you know, I would never bet against his success because that's just a losing proposition uh, historically. But I do worry that the way he's approaching the communications aspect of it may may backfire, right? Like you, you could say he's just being transparent and funny and communicating directly like Trump did uh, in some ways. But, you know, Trump's appeal got old and, and um, 
you know, he, he was, wasn't even appealing to half the country to begin with. So is there something to be said for, you know, a strategy where behind closed doors, Elon is the captain of industry, entrepreneurial, fire half, half of the company, startup, energy, VC, CEO, but um, public facing is kind of more outwardly boring, neutral. D- does that, would that not bode greater success long-term? Well, I think you could quibble with this or that tweet that he puts out. Um, but I think that in general, uh, he has to be able to defend himself. I mean, the thing to realize is that he's under constant attack. Um, so <clears throat> let's, let's go back. I mean, the, the media has been having a collective meltdown about what Elon is doing for the last month. Mm-hmm. Uh, first, they accused him of being a Thanos-type supervillain for snapping 50% of the employees out of existence. <laughs> then they said that he was starving the employees by charging for lunch. Uh, and then most recently, they said the company was going to uh, have an imminent collapse. Why? Because Elon offered the employees a generous voluntary severance package if they didn't want to return to the office and work hard. And it's now two weeks later, and the site is still running just fine. There's been no collapse. And yet all these media personality and uh, you know, these uh, pundits we're tearfully saying their goodbyes on Twitter as if the site was going to you know, implode a, a couple of weeks ago. So you have to understand that he is being attacked in this ridiculous way. And then on top of it, we now find out <clears throat> that um, you know, Apple is talking about, I guess, potentially uh, kicking Twitter out of the App Store, which is insane uh, that they would be able to use their monopoly power to do something like that. And yet, it's being cheered on by these same types of people in the media. So in other words, um, these media critics of Elon are now encouraging Apple to do exactly what they attacked Elon for supposedly doing, which is destroying Twitter. So this is the point we're at. And I just think that Elon has to be able to fight back. And the, the way that you fight back against the managerial elite is you go over their heads mm. directly to the people. Mm-hmm. And again, I mean, the, the fundamental problem with th- these mid-level managers who are out of control is that they, um, they've taken advantage of a delegation of authority that ultimately comes from either the, um, the owners, the, the shareholders in the business sense, or, uh, or the people in a political sense. And, uh, and you need a figure you know, one, like Elon, I think, to be able to appeal to people directly to go over the heads of this sort of, um, of this um, managerial class, because they will never convey your story accurately. So again, you can quibble with this or that tweet, but I do think that he has to be able to make his appeal directly. Now, whenever such a figure arises, who's able to go directly to the people, the media will have a freak out about that. And they will criticize that figure as being a cesarean figure, you know? Mm. Um, But I think the proper way to see it is that, um, that these types of rare figures are able, that what they're seeking is not some sort of dictatorship. What they're seeking is a restoration of accountability. It's to remind the professional class that they ultimately work for the people or work for the shareholders of these companies, that the the people and the shareholders are not subordinate to the experts, that the experts work for them. And the restoration of that accountability, I think, is the, should be the larger political goal, I think, here. Um, I don't think at the end of the day, that, um, that the solution to the problem of, of managerial capitalism is like some sort of revolution. You know, it's not, you know, no one's going to win a class war. I think that advanced capitalist societies do need managers, you know. Um, but I think that we need a restoration of accountability. <clears throat> so it makes it clear that whether it's in business or politics, the managers work for somebody. And, um, and I think that should be the political program is the restoration of that accountability. Um, yeah, well, let me stop there because I've kind of gone on for a while. Yeah. So, um, I mean, at, at the bottom of this Twitter Elon situation is a question of whether Twitter is a town square. Obviously, legally, it's not. It's, it's a private company that can do whatever it wants uh, within the bounds of the law. But how do you look at at Twitter, do you see it as a town square? Do you think it should be like a town square? I do. Um, I think it is the de facto town square. And you know, one of my critiques of censorship is that 
is that the town square has become privatized. You know, when speech became digital, um, the uh, when speech got digitized, the um, the town square uh, got privatized and control of it got centralized in the, uh, the hands of a small number of large tech companies. And they now control our public discourse. So I don't see how you can have an effective uh, First Amendment right or free speech right in our society if all the major forums are controlled by tech companies that are putting their thumb on the scale and exercising censorship on behalf of one political party or one political one, how, one sort how of do you, class. How, how do you... Um... So, so how do you see the existence of something like Parler? Like, if you if you're able to start another another company, why isn't isn't it isn't this just a case of good old fashioned competition and start your own company if you don't like it? Well, isn't Parler an example of the opposite? What happened with Parler is Parler was on its way to being one of the most successful social networking apps. It was number one in, in downloads in the App Store, and when it got too big, all of a sudden it was shut down by Apple and Google, removed from their app stores. So then they went to the web and tried to, you know, run it as a website and then AWS kicked them out. So the point is, you know, when are you going to say that these giant tech monopolies have too much influence? I mean, Mm -hmm. is there really an ability to compete if Apple and Google can throw you out of their app stores? Is there an ability to compete if Amazon can kick you off the internet? Um, and so I, I'm not sure that there really is an effective ability to compete as long as these companies can do that. Um, I do, and this, this example right now of Apple making noises that they're going to kick Twitter out of the app store is a great example of this. Um, so I think at a minimum, if we're going to have the type of competition that you're talking about, we're going to need to put some constraints on the ability of these giant tech monopolies to control the ecosystem. Mm. I don't think we can have a healthy start ecosystem in general, if the monopolies are allowed to run roughshod over um, upstart competitors. And, you know, what I would tell you is, um, aside from maybe Microsoft in the 1990s, Apple is the most powerful tech monopoly that's ever existed. It's certainly the most profitable one. And everybody in Silicon Valley knows this to be true. Everybody talks about it privately. Certainly every application company, from the smallest ones to the biggest ones, live in fear of Apple and what Apple might do to them. And this is a running conversation behind closed doors, but nobody will say it publicly because they are so afraid of retaliation from, from Apple. So I think at the end of the day, we, we're going to have to have some constraints on Apple and Google. And then I think secondarily, Microsoft and Amazon. Um, otherwise, we are not going to have a healthy uh, startup ecosystem and we're not going to have free speech and we're not going to have competition Um, among the various providers to try and be a more innovative town square. Do you know how much your subscriptions really cost? Most Americans think they spend around $80 a month on subscriptions when the actual total is over $200. That's right. You could be wasting hundreds of dollars each month on subscriptions you don't even know about. To take care of this, I use an app called Rocket Money, which used to be called Truebill. The app shows all your subscriptions in one place and then cancels whichever ones you no longer want. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. You may even find you've been double charged for a subscription. And to cancel a subscription, all you have to do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Get rid of useless subscriptions with Rocket Money now. Go to rocketmoney.com slash Coleman. Seriously, this could save you hundreds of dollars per month. That's rocketmoney.com slash Coleman. Cancel your unnecessary subscriptions right now, once again, at rocketmoney.com slash Coleman. In some way, every social media company is a natural monopoly because it benefits from networking effects. Like, you know, everyone's already on Twitter, which gives it a huge advantage over even a slightly better product that is starting up today. And in in the past, I've made a lot of that fact, uh, you know. But it you know it it also occurs to me that can be taken too far. You know, like I, I could I could have said that about MySpace in two thousand five, that it you know has huge networking effects and is therefore a natural monopoly and it's unfair. And then Facebook comes along and just totally destroys it. Um, so I mean, I, I guess the question is if these things are in some way monopolies these tech companies, 
what's the logical solution? Is the logical solution heavy-handed government intervention, uh, breaking up uh, the big tech companies, or what do you see as a path forward? Well, okay, so there's there's a few different kinds of um, tech monopolies or, or you know, uh, tech moats. Uh, the most powerful one by far is the operating system uh, network effect, mm-hmm. where um, the operating system that has the most applications on it is the one that everyone wants to use. And then that becomes, it creates total lock-in once the ecosystem is tipped. Mm-hmm. And there's only really two operating systems. There's the, it's the Apple Google duopoly. It's, it's iOS and Android. Um, they are even more powerful, certainly collectively than um, Microsoft was in the late nineties because mobile computing is just so much more powerful than desktop computing. And it's so much more omnipresent in our lives. And furthermore, with the old um, desktop computing model, you could get on the web through a browser. And so Microsoft did attempt to control that. And that was what the whole litigation around um, Netscape was was about, is whether Microsoft would be allowed to extend their operating system monopoly you know, into the browser and then from there it, into controlling the internet. And I think it was a good thing that the government stopped that. Um, but you already have now the same thing has already taken place where Apple and, and Google Android, they not only control your, your, your phone, the hardware, but they also now control your access to applications through the App Store. And it's already significantly less free than the internet was. So that is like, I think the biggest problem that needs to be addressed is there have to be limits on their ability to benefit themselves at the expense of all the downstream applications. Otherwise, what's going to happen is systematically, these companies will eventually replace all of the key application verticals. You saw this with, with Google Search. Um, in the early days of Google Search, almost every search result led you off-site, off-property. Now, something like more than half of Google searches do not take you off of Google. They keep you on there. They've been systematically replacing the biggest categories of, of clicks that might take you off site. I think that eventually something like that will become true as well in the mobile space, that once the mobile ecosystem becomes mature, Google and Apple will start to, you know, again, replace the, the downstream apps. And they're already doing a bunch of things um, that are cutting into the businesses of their applications, the egregious 30% fee, there's... Um, you know, what they're doing on advertising, uh, benefiting themselves at the expense of the applications. In any event, this is a dynamic that will keep going. And, and, and the problem with it is it will lead to way less innovation. There's no reason for a VC like me to fund a new startup when even if it succeeds wildly in innovating and creating a great product, the, all the value will ultimately be captured um, by the operating system company. So I think this absolutely must be addressed. Um, and the only way to do it is, is legally. Um, now, when you go to, to the other uh, types of apps, um, there are issues with Microsoft and Amazon, but they tend to be a little different. With Microsoft, the big issue is bundling. And we could get into that. And the big issue at Amazon is the way that they privilege their own products over third-party products on their platform. And there are some issues with that. Um, and then you've got you know, sites like Facebook and Twitter which do have network effects, and that is the moat around their business. But it is a uh, much less significant moat than the, um, than the operating system network effects. And, um, and like you said, those network effects are, are not in Super Bowl. They could be overcome potentially. I do think that the antitrust authorities have been focused on the wrong company. I think they've been focused on Facebook. Hmm. And if you just look at the market cap performance over the last year, Facebook has lost something like 70%, whereas Apple's doing just fine. It's now, Apple's now, I think it's like almost 10 times more valuable than Facebook. So um, maybe about uh, seven times. Anyway, the, the point is just that the antitrust authority has been completely focused on the wrong, on the wrong companies. Um, mm-hmm. My main problem with, uh, on the sort of speech regulation side, was when these social networks were literally colluding with each other uh, to engage in censorship. So at the old Twitter, before Elon's ownership, uh, Twitter and Facebook and um, Snap and pretty much every social network, they were all following the same speech controls. And so it wasn't the problem wasn't that any one of those companies 
had a monopoly on speech. It was that they had formed a cartel to regulate speech. They had formed a speech cartel. And that was my problem with them. Yeah, mine, mine as well. Um, I want to pivot for my last two questions before I let you go. You're a film producer as well. You, you produced a Thank You for Smoking and uh, another project that has yet to come out, I believe, right? Yes, I have a movie about uh, Salvador Dali, the painter. So what is it like to be an unapologetic conservative and a film producer? <laughs> um, well, it's, um, I'm not sure anybody's really figured that out, to be honest. Um, so maybe I and, shouldn't have said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, um, uh, as a producer, you kind of uh, give support to a project, but ultimately it's on the actors and the director to create the the, the creative product. So, um, you know, I support the the projects that are interesting to me. And there's nothing political about the Salvador Dali movie. It's really an artist um, biopic. Uh, Thank You for Smoking was, d- did have uh, an interesting political dimension to it. It wasn't partisan politics. It was more a satire of the use of spin as a corporate and political PR tool. And I think people who are interested in politics on both sides of the spectrum can appreciate that movie. It was written, the book was written by Christopher Buckley, who is the son of William F. Buckley and really understands politics well. And um, Chris is a great humorist and satirist of our political culture. So um, that was a movie that was interesting to me because I guess of my interest in politics, but, um, uh, but it wasn't, I don't think it's like pushing a, um, a political agenda. I mean, the thing about if you're trying to do something artistic, it's just not very interesting or, or uh, creatively fulfilling if you're just trying to push an agenda. I mean, this is one of the reasons why I think so much of the entertainment coming out of Hollywood right now is just not very good is because their politics are just too overt and right. um, it's not what people tune in for. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I guess I've, I've kind of dabbled in, in, um, movie producing, but it's not, it's, um, it's sort of a separate activity for me. It's not, uh, an extension of, of, um, you know, what I'm doing politically or or saying on media. Okay. So final question, you and I share, uh, a fascination and I think perhaps obsession with chess. Yeah. And, uh, (laughs) and I, I, uh, first of all, what's your ELO? It's not good. It's like fifteen to sixteen hundred that range. That's better than mine. My uh, chess dot com. I'm like fourteen sixty rapid. Okay. And like eleven hundred blitz. Okay. So yeah, I just play like three two blitz, and mm-hmm. um, I'm in that you know fifteen to sixteen hundred range. If I'm like playing exceedingly well, maybe I can get to like seventeen hundred or something like that. If I mm-hmm. if I'm, my mind is calm and relaxed, but um, but yeah, I so. I, Maybe I'd be better if I played longer games. I don't know. I don't really have time, so I generally play, play the, the quicker games. I heard on the All In podcast, you played a, a game against Magnus as part of two teams. You were playing with Prognananda against Magnus yes. and someone else. That's incredible. Yeah, it was what what good, was that like, and what, what was the occasion? It was a really cool event. So um, there was a, a little tournament that was held in Silicon Valley. It was called like the chess and tech tournament where there were four grandmasters. So it was uh, Magnus, uh, Prognander, who was my partner, um, Wesley Slo- So, and Anish Giri. Nice. And they each had an amateur as a partner. And we played partner chess where what would happen is the um, we would alternate moves. And we couldn't talk to each other about wow. or suggest to each other what to do. So my partner would make a move, then I would make a move, and so on. And you're, so it's team chess. And you got to have uh, one time out where you could c- go consult with your partner for a minute on um, what was happening, but otherwise you couldn't um, you couldn't communicate. And you know we had some time before the game to kind of sync on strategy, but um, it was fun. I mean, I think that. Uh, and then you know the the uh, the amateurs were all sort of roughly around my level, and uh, it was it was a lot of fun. Obviously, to be able to play with Magnus. That's awesome. And, 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 and you the, won, the right? Others. And you won. We did win, yeah. Um, so it's interesting. The, you know, what I was trying to figure out with, with partner chess is like what the strategy should be. And it, I think it's pretty obvious that um, when you have um, four grandmasters who are in the 
27, 2800 range, and then four amateurs who are at, you know, called the 1500 range, that the differences between the grandmasters are irrelevant. And really what matters is just minimizing the, um, the amount of blunders mm. by the amateur. Right. And that really becomes the strategy. It, it kind of took um, uh, Prognananda and I a game. The first game we actually drew, um, and we realized that, or, you know, that, the, the, that the, this basically was the strategy. And so we made a couple of adjustments in the, the second and third games where, um, first of all, Pragu, um used the timeout. We didn't use the timeout in the first game. That was a huge mistake. And um, basically in the subsequent games, he would use the timeout when he spotted um, a blunder by the other side that I could mm-hmm. then capitalize on. So I that see, was huge. Yeah. 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 And then the other, the other interesting thing was um, I just realized I should play extremely solid. I should not right. try to um, play too aggressively. I should let uh, Prognananda basically make the aggressive moves. And then I would just um, try to follow what he, what he was doing um, just to minimize the um, potential for blunders. And um, in any event, once we sort of figured out that that should be the strategy, um, it got it got easier, but um, it was you know it was, re- it was really fun to um, play with those guys. You know, um, I I do watch quite a bit of um, you know chess online. I do too. I watch. I mean, I watch Gotham Chess's recaps of all the games. I watch. I think I got to my current level by watching Daniel Naroditsky's speed runs, who is, in my opinion, the best chess teacher on the internet by a long shot. Um, and I watch Hikaru and, uh, I'm, I'm curious also who is on Magnus's team. So, uh, Magnus's team, he was partnered with, um, Yuri Milner's daughter and, um, she's a, a good young chess player. I think she's around 10 years old or something like that. Uh, but she's a very good young chess player. All right. Well, it's been really fun to talk to you, David. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Thank you for doing this. And um, I just want one last time to direct my listeners in, in the direction of the All In podcast, which is a really fun roundtable podcast. You can hear David's takes every week, uh, sometimes maybe even more, t- more than once a week. And uh, if there's anywhere else you want to direct my listeners, now is the time. Your Twitter, your uh, anywhere else. Yeah, I have a Twitter account. and um, But yeah, I think the podcast is the, the main thing. Um, All right. but, uh, great to talk to you today and for this, you know, great to have this kind of long form conversation and to work out with you some of these ideas that I've been noodling over. Um, you know, the all in pod tends to be, well, there's four of us and, uh, four of us constantly interrupting each other. And so, yeah. uh, we're not like doing any like deep thought pieces. It's more like, um, just hot takes. Um, so it's fun just to talk through some of these, um, you know, ideas with you. Yeah, it's fun for me too. I've wanted to do it for a while. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. Thanks, Coleman. If you appreciate the work I do, the best ways to support me are to subscribe directly through my website, colemanhughes.org, and to subscribe to my YouTube channel so you'll never miss my new content. As always, thanks for your support. Thanks for your support.